always would leave the place. Fight and hurt each other. We try to make it better. Can't seem to get it right. Won't let go of a pride. Can't see the pain when you do. Remains, no openness for change. Reaching for the light to get us through. God, we want more of you. Come, Holy Spirit. So patient, you never hide. For us, you're always waiting. You're waiting. Always believe the best. Yet yeah, you're a loving friend. You're always loving us through. Oh, you will never fail. Be there, you always will. Shine us with your light to get us through. God, we want more. Spirit, move and move. It's the love that we long for to bring us together, make the broken things new. God, we want more of you, of you. We long for your heart. For your heart, we're longing for your heart. We're longing for your heart.
It's another nice, beautiful Sabbath morning, and I look forward to uh, Sabbath. At the end of the past Sabbath, I look forward to the next Sabbath. It is the day when we do not have to go to work. It is the day when we come together to fellowship with one another all day long and above all to meet with the Lord who promised to be with us when we meet in this manner. So we are in Sabbath school where we are studying our Sabbath school lesson or as a matter of fact we are reviewing trust everybody is studying the Sabbath school lesson during the week. And then on Sabbath morning, we take another look to make sure we are walking together. Today we are talking about mission to my neighbors. Mission to my neighbors. That's what we're talking about today. What is our memory verse? That memory verse is taken from Luke chapter 10, verse 27, from the New King James Version. Let's all say it together. He answered, love thy neighbor as you... All right, now let's, 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 let's start over and let's do it together. He answered... Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength and with all your mind and love who your neighbor as yourself and love your neighbors as you love yourself. I hope you love yourself. Some of us don't but you ought to love your neighbors as you love yourself. Thank you, dear Lord, for what we have uncovered this week as we studied the Bible. As we review together now, we ask that you would stop by and make your presence felt. Bring back to our minds the precious gems that we have uncovered. And may we obey your will and be saved when it is yours to come, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome those who are joining us online. It's a joy to have you always on Sabbath morning here at the uh, Community Worship Center of Seventh-day Adventist. Mission to my neighbor. While Jesus in his ministry, one guy who thought he was a smarty, a wise guy. He could trip up Jesus. Went to Jesus and asked Jesus a question. Not really a question. He just wanted to see where Jesus was because he, he had a good idea what he's talking about. And observe, I say, just an idea what he's talking about, but he is talking to the majesty of heaven, and he asks the question, what was the question he asked? What was the lawyer's question? What shall I do that I might have eternal life? Now, that is a Jewish concept. That was the Jewish idea of salvation. The Jews believed they could work their way into heaven. They are saved in the kingdom by works of right doing. And Jesus wanted to make it clear to them that you cannot be saved by works of right doing. You can't do enough right to be saved. Heaven is so expensive that the Lord just have to give it to you free. We can't pay for it. Nothing we can do to earn it. So he says, I'm giving it to you free of cost. So he asked the Jewish question, what must I do 
Although he had in mind to trip up Jesus, yet he had the Jewish custom in the back of his head. What must I do that I might inherit eternal life? Oh, and Jesus says, ah, now you give me an opportunity to get some stuff in your head. <laughs> That's what Jesus said to him. Jesus asked him a question. What is in the law? How do you read the law? And where is the law? Right in the Bible, isn't it? So first of all, Jesus turned his attention to the Bible. He did that in the wilderness with the devil. He says, it is written. And I wonder if this is what we are doing today when we are tempted. You are no match for the devil. He's smarter than you. Do you not have to run to the Bible to the word of God when tempted to do wrong? Well, if you are to run to the Bible, it means you got to know what's in the Bible. So we need to study the word of God. We need to go back to the Bible, study, because Jesus in several cases referred to the scriptures. And so he said to this lawyer, what is in the Bible? What is in the Ten Commandments? And the brother, look at his answer. He says, you are to love God with all your heart and love your neighbors as yourself. But now, which one in the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God? And then which one says, thou shalt love thy neighbors as thyself? Which, any, any of the, the Ten Commandments say so? Run it down in your head. First commandment says, have no other God. The second commandment, worship no other God. Remember the Sabbath day, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. Where does it say, thou shalt love the Lord thy God? So you see, this guy is familiar with the scriptures. He knows that the first four commandments is love to God. Amen. And the remaining six is love to our neighbors. And so he answered the philosophical answer. Now he, he's taking on the majesty of heaven. Don't even know who he's talking to. Wise guy. Love thy neighbors. I said, then if you know that, what are you coming to me for? What do you ask me a question for? But Jesus says, oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Jews, the, the lawyer spoke to Jesus, but he was looking at him as this little nobody from Nazareth. So he came at him with the scriptures and with his philosophical points because Jesus was not supposed to know these things. Mm. The Jews kept the words to themselves. They did not teach the other people. And remember when, uh, who was it, Nathaniel, I think, said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Mm -hmm. And that was his approach. Do we do the same thing? Look down on people? Because they come from such a place, then they shouldn't know anything. They shouldn't do anything. They shouldn't even worship God. And this was part of his approach. He couldn't verbalize it in that way, but he set it up in such a way so that he could show himself and the knowledge that he had and try to put Jesus down. Who was the word and became flesh among us? Oh yes, the Jewish scholar looking down on that little Messiah walking to and fro Galilee all over the place. Came with his chest out. Hey mister, I have a question for you. And Jesus said, boy, I'm glad you asked me this question. Because I'm going to talk to you now. And what did Jesus say? He said you must love God with all your heart, love your neighbors as yourself. And what did Jesus tell him? He was wrong? No. Or he was right? He was right, but who's your neighbor? Jesus said, you're right. <laughs> you're onto something there. But now let me put, let me push this a little further. Just a little further. You, you're correct. 
We are to love the Lord with all of our hearts, and we are to love our neighbors. But the question this morning is, who is your neighbor? The person that lives next door to you? Across the street? Who is your neighbor? Oh, well, we could stay there for a while, couldn't we? The question forever in that story of the Good Samaritan, which is not actually a parable, because the Pharisee and the Levite who were there, the priest and the Levite, actually were members, right? They were listening to the story as well. And so it's anyone who needs our help. So our neighbor is just not the person who lives next door. It's not the brother church. It's anyone who needs the help. So when we are given help, people are not to qualify by good deeds or coming to church or paying the tithes. The only consideration is that you need help, and you're my neighbor. Yes. Since the remaining sixth commandment says, love your neighbors as yourself, I must know who my neighbor is. And my neighbor, I saw in my study here a statement, Ellen White says, our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Anybody need your help? You know anybody who need your help? <coughs> There's a kind of person that need your help. Have you ever talked to some <coughs> individual who tell you everything that is in the Bible and they never open the Bible once? Have you ever come across such people? They tell you everything that the Bible says and then interpret the Bible for you. But they never one day open the scripture themselves to read. Oh, I have run across so many of those. But the Bible says, my neighbor is every individual who need. If there is anything your neighbor need this morning, that person that work with you on the job, rub shoulder to you, in, shoulder to shoulder with you in that office, wherever you are, that person need to hear from you that Jesus is coming again. You need to help somebody. Some folk on the job do some crazy stuff. Jesus once says, "Forgive them; they don't know." A lot of people who are around you don't know what life is all about. They are your neighbors. Do you not need to tell them? That's what the Lord says we need to do. We need to tell them Jesus is coming again. Pastor God, there's a little point I want to throw in right there. Um, this, this ruler, actually, this lawyer did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah because he called him Master, mm. not Lord. Um, when, when, and so he chose to be philosophical. When, when, we, when people ask philosophical questions like Nicodemus, he asked Jesus, how can a man be born again? Jesus said, you must be born of the water and of the spirit before you can enter into the kingdom. So when, when you're trying to go philosophically, it means to say you're dodging the truth. And so this is why arguments can never win a person, convert. The more reasons you give to prove the Bible, it only gives the skeptic more reason to doubt. Mm. Right? Yes, Some of the most intelligent people are the people who doubt. My, my, my. Who, doubt, who are doubtful. And so this, this is what the lawyer, he did not recognize. But we need not only to recognize Jesus as master, but as savior and Lord. Yeah. I, know, I know of an experience of that. My father, may he rest in peace, he banned a relative from coming to the house yeah. because he would come just to argue mm. the word and he knew better. Yeah. If he met a non-Adventist person, he would preach. And he would show how much he knew. But when he met uh, you, he would try to get a text or something and bring it down and bring all kinds of stuff. My father said, listen, don't you ever come back to this house. So we didn't, at first we thought that was kind of mean. We didn't understand. He said, because I'm training my children one way and you don't come here and talk craziness. You know? So we have to be careful too because sometimes people who know better 
they talk all things just to show themselves and find all kind of arguments and it would lead people astray if because not everybody has the same knowledge and understanding of the scriptures we have to grow the bible say first the milk then the meat so we have to be careful even among our own that people who talk things that are contrary and when they know that too oh my friends uh, let me tell you this brother met his match have you ever come across some educated fools educated two, three PhDs, and you say some little thing, you, I hardly have anything in my head, educate, but you say something from the word of God, Amen. and they're all confused. They give you some answer that's off the wall mm -hmm. with three PhDs. Mm -hmm. You have something that the world does not have. Bible is the word of God. Oh, Jesus was so happy to listen to that brother. Mm. And this brother was so happy to fold his hand. Mm. So I'm going to trip this guy up this morning. And he met his match. Mm -hmm. Jesus told him, Jesus, Jesus made him feel good. He said, brother, you answer right. You say good. Now, you know that brother feel good when Jesus said that to him. Oh, wow, you know. Jesus says you answered right. So that's what that's the psychology you've got to use sometime in winning souls for Jesus, in sharing your faith. Use your head. You know, it's, you say something that's all right. I commend you on that, but now here is something more. Jesus took full advantage and left that lawyer with a different concept of salvation. Yes, um, so to continue, Pastor Goff, I'd like to just accent one of the points you made there. Um, educated fool, you said. Sometimes the more people are educated, it seems that they, it's the more ignorant they become. Um, one guy wrote, he said, um, if, if a guy steals um, bowls and nuts from the, from the train, um, from the transportation industry, um, and you send him to school, he's going to steal the entire train track after. So that is what education does. To us. It just makes us more artful in whatever we want to do. And this is why Satan is so artful in deceiving people because he's very, he's very bright. He's very educated. But I want to ask some very basic questions. Why? Why do we need to take the mission to our neighbors? And Revelation 14, 6 and 7 answers the question. He says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. The angel isn't walking, the angel is flying. That means there's a sense of urgency, right? And he has the everlasting gospel. It's the only gospel. There's no other gospel, there's no other door that we can be saved except through Christ Jesus, okay? And it says he's flying there in the, the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred tongue and people, to every nationality, to every race, to every tongue, to every language, and to every color people. It means the white, the black, the brown. It means everybody. So there's some urgency there. And these were some of the last words that Jesus spoke. He said, go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every nation. And if it's the last words that somebody says to you before they die or before they go someplace, it's important. Right, Pastor Goff, you agree with me there? That's right. The other point is that other people's salvation depend upon our letting them know the gospel. Mm -hmm. Christ is coming back soon. He says the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment began in 1844 when Christ started the new phase of his ministry, the investigative phase. Now it will take several hours to explain all that. But there's a book written by Mrs. White, called The Great Controversy, that you can read that book and you can get all the answers there. So the investigative judgment started in 1844 and it's continued. Christ moved to the most holy place of the sanctuary to begin the atonement, to begin the work of judging the cases of those who confessed to believe in him. 
not of those who are godly, but those who once professed to believe in Jesus Christ. To whom? The second question is, to whom? I think we answer that question to everyone, to our neighbors, to everyone around us. And how should we present the gospel? Well, Jesus left us a model. Jesus mingled with the people. Okay, Jesus didn't remain in church all day and preach sermons from the pulpit. He mingled with the people. Okay? And then he ministered to their needs. So if you were hungry, he fed you. If you were sick, what did he do, Pastor God? He healed you. So Jesus was a practical man. He was out there. And then, last of all, he presented the gospel. You know, sometimes we turn it around and we want to present the gospel first. And sometimes we are insensitive to people's needs. So this is not what Jesus did. So it's by preaching, teaching, by doing deeds of kindness. And mind you, deeds of kindness cannot save us. But deeds of kindness works. They are the fruit of faith, not the proof of it. Because it is also possible, Pastor God, for us to do good things, but we are doing it from ulterior motives. So, so works is the fruit of faith, not the proof of it. So we do good works because we are saved, not to save ourselves. Jesus is the only one who can save us. Now, I'd like to accent just one aspect of witnessing that I think is very underrated and we don't pay a lot of attention to, and that is the ministry of hospitality. You know why I became a member of the church here? Because when I came here, Pastor Goff was nice to me. <laughs> and Sister Jack greeted me well. And the gift of hospitality goes a very long way. What difference would it make when we pay attention to our visitors, those who come, those people who bring their babies to be blessed, if we invite them for lunch, if we put them at a special table, if, if, we, if we have someone to sit there with them and to talk, it would make a big difference. God sends people right on our doorsteps. You know, I'll share my experience. We had visited a church um, in, a, in, a, in, a far, in a different state. I won't say what state it is, and I won't say what um, type of people were predominantly present at church. I would leave those things known. But uh, all of us from our family, all 11 of us visited that church, and we were not welcomed. The pastor preached one of the most amazing sermons that I ever heard. In my, in, my, in my church attendance. Yet, we sat right at the front pew, and he didn't welcome us. After church, they were having lunch, and none of the members asked us, invited us for lunch. Now, what is ironic about the whole thing is that they were having visitation the same afternoon to go in the community to invite people out, okay? So there was a family of 11. Now, no one knew if we were new in the area, if we were looking for a church. Now, whether or not we would have continued to come to that church, I don't know. But it's very unlikely that we would have done. So that church missed an opportunity to witness and to win 11 souls. But they were planning to go out that afternoon. And sometimes we are guilty of the same thing. We have That's people why, right here. That is why you are a member of CWC. <laughs> yes, yes. Because at CWC, we yes. welcome our visitors, don't yes. we? Yes, yes. Bless the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. And I think I have the last point that I want to make here that um, um, okay, Jesus also witnessed on a one-to-one -one basis. Sometimes we want to preach to big congregations. We want to go to Japan, and we want to go there, and we want to have big cruises. But Jesus often paid attention to the one-to-one -one audience. You remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus came to Jesus. He witnessed to him. You remember the woman at the well? Jesus left where he was and went there specially to minister to the woman at the well. You remember Lazarus? Jesus went home to Lazarus. And so the one-to-one -one audience is very important. We are, to not, we are to pay very good attention, Pastor Goff, to witness to people as individuals, not as masses. And we are to identify people's needs, and we are to minister. And when we do that, our church will be filled. We would want to have a bigger church. May God bless us as we continue to do mission for him. Amen. Amen. All the Lord wants us to do 
is to identify who your neighbor is. And from my study of the Bible, I see that my neighbor is everybody, not just here in North America, but throughout the harvest field in the beard, because Jesus entrusted to our hands the last message of salvation. 1844, the elder indicated that in 1844, three angels' message was entrusted to this church. And the message is, first angel's message says, uh, worship God. Second angel message says, Babylon is fallen. The last angel's message says, if any man worship the beast in his image. No other church can preach that. Because if they do, they have to keep the Sabbath. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they're not preaching. So we have a message that the Lord wants to be heralded to the ends of the earth. And Jesus says, when that is done, I will come. Anybody here want Jesus to come? Amen. Let us be up and be about our Father's business. Thank you, Pastor. It seems like there's not much for me to cover because I, th I think we've really captured the essence of the lesson. Uh, but I, I just want to emphasize the fact that the mission is a global mission. Amen. It's a universal mission. In John 3 verse, John 3 verse 16, they... The mission is summarized where it says that for God so loved the world. God so loved the mm. world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe it should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. The lawyer asked the question, what sh should I do to have eternal life? Here we find the answer. Whosoever believeth in him. And then we, we hear the lawyer himself saying that we should love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind. strength, mind, to, in order to be saved. So here we see, as we examine, juxtapose these two texts, we see that love means, love and belief are synonymous. Mm -hmm. Because it says, if you want to be saved, you have to believe. Whoever believes in me shall be saved. And then we, we, we see, the other text says that we should love the Lord and love our neighbors in order to be saved. So it means that love is expressed through our faith Amen. in God, our belief. Love means that we are sold out to God. When we love God, we are all in. We are sold out to God. We give God our allegiance. God is the beginning and the end in our lives. That's what it means to love God. That's what it means to believe God. To trust God implicitly and totally. So... This is important as we discuss mission and, and, and sharing mission with our neighbors. It's, this particular story is important. Why is it important? When we understand the fact that the, 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 uh, the Israelites, the Jews, believed that when the, when the Bible talks about God loving the, the, you know, the world, they limited the world to the Jewish people. For God, now? What is happening now in Israel is the same thing that has brought them down to the fact that they think they can exterminate the Palestinian people because that area and everything there and God and everything he has belongs to them and them alone. You know, and that's what's causing it. So we see the whole thing coming right down to today. Exactly. So, so for God's all of the world... That he gave his only son, that whosoever believe it. They 
believed that the world, uh, the world consisted of the Jewish nation. And it's Im important to understand or, or, or to, to dissect this conversation, this interaction between the lawyer and Jesus. First, he was trying to elevate himself, to show, to, to, to parade his knowledge and his learning. Now, how much of us are guilty of doing the same? We are educated, Pastor Gough mentioned three PhDs, we're educated, we, we're lawyers, we're, we're doctors, and oftentimes we parade our learning, parade our credentials. It's more about telling what we have and showing what we have than it is about loving in action. Also, it's important to understand that the, the, uh, the, the lawyer was trying to justify an exclusive spirit. Jesus said, he said to, to, to Jesus that in order to be saved, you have to love your neighbor, love the Lord with all your, 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 your soul, with, with all your mind, your soul, your strength. Right? And love, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? Because back then, they believed that the gospel, the, the, you know, salvation was only for the Jews. So the neighbor... The neighbor represented anybody who was within the community, that, 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 that community of people, the Jews. The Samaritans were considered dogs. They were not worthy of salvation. So Jesus used this opportunity to teach an important message that salvation is global, salvation is no respecter of persons, is no respecter of ethnicity, our class, our faith, it's universal, it's global, it's for everybody. Everybody. So Jesus taught an important lesson through this story. Jesus, Jesus taught through stories. Through stories. And he gave the story of the, the, the Samaritan. It's interesting to note that Jesus, the protagonist in the story, was a Samaritan. The star in the story was a Samaritan. And inspiration tells us that the man who was robbed and, and beaten and left to die, he was a Jew. He was a Jew. The Jews regarded the Samaritans as dogs. If this man was not beaten up and was not, um, you know, left in the state where he could move, maybe he would have refused help from the Samaritan. But his situation was such that he, he couldn't, he, he couldn't um, do anything but just accept, to accept the, the, the help and the kindness and compassion of the Samaritan. The religious people, they passed him. They were too busy. One person said that you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. They were late for, you know, perhaps, you know, the, the priest was late for, for, you know, for the ordinance of the day. The Levite also passed. Maybe he was late for Sabbath school. Was late for Bible class. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. I, you know, I, I got to get, 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 get to church on time. When there's somebody there who was dying. That's what Christianity is about. That's what church is about. Not about the ordinances and, you know, the rituals. It's about caring for people. Um, a little bit, uh, yes. let me just jump in a little bit. Now, somebody told me a little bit of a humor, a humorous story here about that story. Um, what they said, the reason that the priest and the Levite passed by is that the man was already robbed. <laughs> I don't know if that is true, but so I heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's interesting, right? So the, the religious people passed by, the church folk passed by, and this Samaritan, this lowly person, he was going about his business, right? And yet he had compassion to stop. 
he put the man on his own horse. He was going on business, but yet he stopped. He could have called 911 and said, this is not my thing. You know, let the, let, 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 you know, let the officials take care of this. Let the first responders take care of this. But he took ownership of this mission. He took ownership of it. This is my responsibility. He put the man on his own horse. He could have said, hey, this man is blooded. I don't want him to mess up my stuff. I have, a, I have an important meeting I have to attend. I, you know, he put him on his horse. He's blooded. And then he took him to the inn. He took him to the, the hotel. And the, the, the Bible tells us he cared for him himself. He cared for him. And then he had to go to a meeting. And then he hired a sitter. He said, listen, I have to go. Here's some money. Denarius. Two days, equivalent to two days wages. Take care of him. Sit with him for me and take care of him until I come back. Right? If you need anything else, here's some money. You can use to take care of it until I come back. He took care of it himself. He didn't call, he didn't make the net, network news. That particular situation didn't appear on the news because what? He didn't call 911. He de dealt with it privately. Love in action. Love that in action. was love in action. And coming from who he was, being a Samaritan, that was powerful because the Jews could have stoned him for coming near to this Jewish brother who was now considered unclean according to their laws for interacting with this person. So we have to be careful how we uh, look at people and categorize them. The text says, whosoever will. And that means that every one of us is valuable to God. And he said he's not willing that any should perish so that he opens the door. So who are we to shut it? Who should be there and who should not be there, right? And even for today, if you're walking on the sidewalk and some Jewish people are coming down, they will step down in the street so they don't walk too close to you. So, you know, they think, I don't know which heaven they're going to because I don't know about anybody else, but Sister Farrell plans to be there. So they better get used to me here. Yep. So the fact is that here we have help coming from the most unexpected of places, yep. from the Samaritan. The question for us is, as a church, are we subcontracting out our responsibilities mm -hmm. to others mm -hmm. in this community? If this church were to close its doors tomorrow, would the community miss it? Are we leaving, are we, are, are we leaving up the, the care of the people in this community? to others, other churches? Are we saying, okay, that's the role of the government? You know, um, that's not our role. We have a part to play. Ellen White says, our neighbors is anybody in need of our help. Anybody in need of our help. And the, the interesting thing is, these days, is that the world has become so globalized. The world has gotten increasingly smaller. Especially with the, the advancement in you know, technology, information and communication technology, faith, you know, you know, social network. You can, you can, through your social network, connect with people you know, at, in far-flung places of the world. So you, you can help people, you know, in distant lands from even here. You know, there's a, a person I'm connected with. On, on LinkedIn, which is the professional version of Facebook. I've never met her in person. But recently she, she uh, posted something on LinkedIn indicating that she had stage four cancer. And she had a GoFundMe, which is, a, which is a, an online platform that people use to, to raise funds from their, their connections. And I donated money through go, go fund me, to go, go fund me towards our treatment. Mm -hmm. That's caring. I don't know her. She lives in Canada. I'm here in the US. But I was able to help someone, you know, far removed from where I'm currently at. 
So your neighbor is anybody within your reach. And these days, that person could be somebody in the, you know, the furthest remote place of this, of this world. So your neighbor, as this lesson points out today, to us today, is that is not somebody who is necessarily, um, you know, who lives adjacent to you. That's a neighbor as well. But it expands the definition of a neighbor mm -hmm. to include everybody, anybody within your, within your reach, anybody you can, you can help. So the challenge for us today is to make ourselves available to, Amen. to help, to be, to be a support to others. Let us commit. Let us commit today. If, if we haven't been doing so in terms of caring for the, the needy, the downtrodden, those who are facing injustice, you know, who are exposed to bigotry, if we have, haven't been doing a good job of helping the, to, to, to lift up these people and to relieve their suffering, today is a new, is, we can turn a new page. Mm -hmm. We can turn a new page. In the story of the uh, Good Samaritan, Jesus was teaching a tremendous lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, he's talking to a lawyer, an attorney, counselor. And here it is. The priest came by, he says, two enemies. Enemies, as our elder pointed out, the enemies of one another. The Jews and the Samaritans don't get along at all. And here is a Jew in the gutter with water running down, his blood is running down. And the pastor came by. The Bible says the priest came by. And he looked. But you see, it is a concept of the Jews that I mustn't get my hand dirty before I go in the sanctuary. So I let him die and I go to church. And then the elder came by. Who is the elder? The Bible says the priest. The, the Levite. But the priest. No, the priest is the pastor. And the Levite now, the elder, church elder. <laughs> church elder came by and said, oh, me? I, I can't mess up. I ain't got time for that. And so, but then now, the good Samaritan, an enemy of the Jews, came by, fixed him up, put him on his ass, take him to the hospital. But one thing they forget and we are forgetting as we analyze the story. When he left that money with the proprietors, he said to them, when I return, I will pay. Amen. Well, now that's Jesus talking. Amen. Jesus is saying, when I come again, I will repay. Amen. Oh, how we need to reach out to our neighbors and our friends. Amen. First, our lesson says you need to identify who your neighbors are. And once you identify them, they need your help. Maybe not just a cake or something on the corner, but everybody need what you have. You have some information of the word of God that the world does not have. Everybody need it. Therefore, we need to be up and be about our Father's business because Jesus is coming again. And the coming of Jesus is dependent on this church because we have a message that must be heralded to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, when that is done, I will come. And when I come, I will repay. Amen. Pastor, Pastor, real quick. I, I wanted to ask you a little question there. Um, how eminent is the coming of Christ? How eminent is the coming of Christ? In terms of the signs and the things that are happening. Do you think it's very close or we haven't? <laughs> Bless very the close. Lord. Very, very close. I just want to quickly add, add something, uh, Pastor, that that's in saying that we should, you know, put our, 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 our money, our action where our mouth is, mm -hmm. right? Not just about um, talking about the gospel, we need to um, demonstrate uh, the love of God to fellow men. Give them a foretaste of, of, of what eternal life looks like today. And that our actions don't mean that we're, we're going to be saved. 
by our actions. Our actions are a reflection or demonstration that we're already saved. It's an expression of our faith and our salvation in Jesus. Amen for that. Lord, thank you so much for what we have learned from the Bible as we studied even this week. Thank you, Lord, for the review we have had and we've learned so much as we study the scriptures. Please, Lord, help us to be up and be about our Father's business. For soon and very soon, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We will see you next week when our subject will be Mission to the Needy. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshiped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit the amazing Bible timeline at BibleHistory.com.
Show me the grave. But she said, Lord, you don't understand. He's been there for days. The gravestone will go back. And then she cried. Lazarus, come forth and somebody said, Don't be discouraged, cause he's still the same. He'll soon be here, he'll roll back the stone, and he'll call out your name.
Good morning and welcome to CWC. My name is Naya. Thank you for joining us in the worship today. We want to take the time to welcome our first time guests and our returning CWC family members. If it's your first time worshiping with us, let us know in the chat below. Even though you're worshiping online, you will still be able to experience the love and support of our virtual CWC family. The Bible says, for where two or three are gathered together in his name, there I am in the midst of them. Now, let's join the service that's already in progress. he had heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am help. Therefore, therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with songs will I praise him. Trusting in your words, your promises that you laid in them, we come to worship. We come to magnify you. We come to adore you. We come to lift you up on high because you're worthy to be praised. So accept our thanksgiving. Accept our praise. Accept our worship. Because we seek it in the powerful, priceless, matchless name of Jesus our Lord and Savior, and soon coming King. Amen and amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Oh, you may be seated. Would all our visitors please stand? On behalf of Pastor Jason Ridley, Pastor Vincent Goff, and the members of Community Worship Center, Seventh-day Adventist Church, 
we extend to you a warm welcome to our hymn theme music day. To our online viewers, we extend to you a warm virtual welcome. Psalm 95 verses 1 to 2 states that we should come and sing for the Lord and sing joy to the Lord and to come before him with thanksgiving and exalt him with music and song. So as we worship together today, I hope that you are blessed and that when you leave this place, you will leave as a new person rejoicing in the Lord. Welcome again and have a happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, brethren. Here are the announcements. Today, Sugar Bun meets immediately after the Divine Hour in the multipurpose room downstairs. Couples are encouraged to attend. Lunch will be served. On December 9th is Children's Day and also our annual Children's Banquet, ages 16 and below. The dress code is semi-formal to formal. Monetary gift is preferred. For more information, see sisters Natalie Young, Natalie Williams, and Sister Edwards. On December 4th, the first Sabbath in December, Pastor Jules will be here in attendance. The church is encouraged to attend in person. January 6th, to the 27th is our 21 days of fasting. We're encouraged to read this book, 21 Days of Prayer to Overcome Strongholds by the author Jim Maxim. The cost is $6.99. Seniors are encouraged to allow someone from here to purchase it for them for security reasons. Today, Brother Jason Ridley celebrates his first birthday, so we might want to wish Brother Jason Ridley a happy birthday and all the best life has to offer him. These are the announcements. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, so good to see you on this Sabbath morning. Come on, you can do better than that if God brought you through another week. And into the house of the God on this Sabbath morning. It's so good to see each and every one of you. We're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us on today. Both our in-person audience and our audience online. At this time, I'm going to invite uh, Elder D'Souza to come, uh, who has a special word of thanks to share at this time. You all look so beautiful and wonderful. I'm here to say a very sincere thank you and our biggest appreciation to everyone who participated in last week's prayer and fasting. Um, we all appreciate you being here for fellowshipping with us. We would like to say thank you to all our ushers, our greeters, our musicians, the praise team, the pastors, the elders, the deacons, the deaconesses, young adults, youth, and children. We were united through prayer and fasting, and therefore, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit tabernacled with us, and we felt his presence hovering over us all day. So we give God thanks for his peace, his grace, his mercy, and continue to pray. And as we continue along life's journey and we are growing together, let us remember Philippians 4 and verse 6, right? Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving, right? Let your requests be made known unto God. 
To God be the glory for all that he did for us last week. We had a great time and we finished the day in high spirits, in evening sacrifice, dancing, singing, and giving thanks to God. We give him all glory and praise. here today. Amen. Amen. On last Sabbath, we had a special prayer for Mervis and Shalitris as we informed the church, let them know about our mission trip next year to India, and they were leaving to go and be a part of a mission trip and to do a site visit for us. They left on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, and they arrived on Friday morning, and I have a few pictures that I want to show you of Mervis and Shalitris and the group. You guys can put those on the screen. So there's Mervis and Shalitris there on the bus. Amen. We're part of the team. They look tired. I believe they had just arrived there in India after three flights. Amen. Amen. And here you'll see they're in worship during the evangelistic meeting. So it's, it's, it's Saturday night there uh, in India now. They're about 12 or 13 hours uh, ahead of us. And so this, I believe, was the opening night ceremony service. And then there's one more. There's a picture of the group all together, and you'll see uh, Sister Mervis is over on this side, and then Salitras is up on the back row on this side. And uh, let's continue to pray for them. Amen? And uh, Mervis, she texted me this morning, let me know how excited they are, and, but that there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Uh, and they are just excited about the work that's going to, mission work that's going to begin uh, on tomorrow there in India. So let's remember to keep them in our prayers over these next couple of weeks. She will leave uh, on November the 29th. They will leave on November the 29th to return home. Amen? And again, our trip will be next year around this same time in November to India, and you'll hear more details uh, once they return. Amen? Amen. This morning's hymn of worship is 434, We Speak of the Well, The Rose. Please stand.
be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time. How many of you need God to do something today? It's prayer time. And I want to call out my dear sister Fiona. Some of you may have heard she lost a sister this week, her younger sister. 43 years old, passed away. So, Sister Viona, we're praying with you. Our hearts are with you. She's leaving on Thursday to head home uh, to bury her sister. So let's keep Viona in our prayers today. Uh, sister Chana's brother and sister in Canada, brother and his wife, the Bennetts, are in need of our prayers today, as well as our very own brother and sister, Brian not feeling well today. They're normally here sitting uh, here in the, in the sanctuary, but they're not feeling well today, and so we want to remember them uh, in our prayers today. And as the praise team gets ready to lead us in this song of worship, our prayer song, this beautiful hymn, I invite all those who need to just press a little closer to the altar to cast all your cares upon him. I invite you to come down at this time as we sing this prayer song. If you know it, why don't you sing along with the praise team? As we come before you now, the words to that hymn echo true. Father, we need thee every hour. But Father, I'd say we could go even further, that we need you every minute. Every second, every moment of every day, God, we're in need of you. And so, Father, and especially on this day, there are those who are at the altar. There are those who are tuning in in their homes, maybe sitting on their couch, but even at this very moment, there are tears rolling down their face because of a loss or because of pain or something that they're going through. And all the more, God, we need you right now. And so, Father, we call out our very own Sister Fiona and family, God, as they are on the mourner's bench mourning the loss of her dear sister Carla. God, we ask, God, that you would wrap your loving arms around this family. And that you would give to them uh, the peace that only you can give. The peace, God, which surpasses all understanding. And God, even in this moment of loss and hurt and sadness, God, I ask God that even though it does not replace the, the loss in this moment, but God, remind this family of the hope that death is not the end. For the believer, for the dead in Christ, God shall live again. What a reunion that will be. 
And Father, we ask even now that you would press closer to the Bennett family there in Canada, to the Bryan family, God, who are in need of a touch from you. And for those who have come down to the altar, God, I don't know all of the issues and the needs and the challenges, uh, and they may be fast, and they may be vast and, and large, and some may have been going on for a while, but God, there is nothing that is too hard for you. And I'm thankful to know, God, that, that you are so great, God, that you can handle all of our needs all at the same time. And so we're asking, God, that even now you would begin to move uh, in this sanctuary, move uh, in the homes of those who are tuning in, move uh, right now in the homes of those, God, who, who, who their desire was to come here this morning, their desire was to tune in this morning, but they are laying in their beds and uh, they're laying on their couch in pain hurting God uh, because of what they're going through and the devil may seem like he is winning uh, but we give him no glory in this place and we ask God that you would move upon them now in this season of thanksgiving we ask God that you would comfort the hurting those who have experienced losses during this season, those who experienced loss during this year, God, who when the, the memory of that loss is coming fresh as we are entering this holiday season, when families would oftentimes gather together, but this year mama won't be there. This season, daddy won't be there, husband won't be there, wife won't be there, brother or sister, a child, daughter or son won't be there. We ask God for comfort and healing. And Father, on this day, as we have come to worship you in song, we're praying, God, that maybe it's the words of a hymn or the words of a song that a choir sings, a soloist, God, that will minister to your people today. And that even if we have come hurting, but by the time we leave this place, we'll leave rejoicing because we had an encounter with Jesus and our life will never be the same. This is our prayer in your holy name. Let every lover of the risen Christ say amen, amen, and amen. service as outlined I'm going to ask uh, if the elders would join me on this platform at this time all of our elders please come and we're so happy on this day one of our members, you may be wondering, 
Where has she been? I haven't seen her in a while. But we're so happy to inform you today uh, that she's in good hands. She has transitioned to Tennessee for good reason. A few months ago, she got married. Somebody say amen. amen. And that is Tara, the former Miss Tara Herbert. She is now Tara Lake, and she is here with her husband, Felix. And let's give them a round of applause. We invite them to come at this time. And we weren't able to do this before, so we want to just lay hands on them while they're here and pray over them uh, as God blesses them uh, in this new journey together. Yes, it was June the 11th. Amen? Amen. And so we want to uh, just pray over you at this time. Are there any others who want to just join us uh, and come be a part of this prayer and lay hands on Tara, any members, close relationship? We invite you to join us at this time as we come together. Elders, let's come at this time. You can come. So we celebrate black love. Amen. 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 Now, you know, you guys are always welcome to move to New York. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for holy matrimony. We thank you, God, for this couple who have decided to become one in you. We thank you, God, for their desire to have the church to pray over their union together. And Father, as we are surrounding them now, May it represent your guardian angels surrounding their marriage. May it block, God, any schemes that the adversary has designed to try to cause dis division and disruption in their marriage. May it block any family member or friend, God, who tries to get a little too involved in their union. May your holy angels continue to put a hedge around them, blocking out all the noise. And Father, as we lay hands on them, may it symbolically represent your hand resting upon them. May it symbolically represent your hand holding them up. May it symbolically represent God that all the days of their marriage that they're in your hands. Father, we acknowledge that no trials will come. But Father, I pray that you'd help them to always remember the love that brought them to this point. To choose one another. I pray, God, that you would bless them in every aspect of their marriage. Bless their home life. Bless the doors of employment for them. So that one or both will always have employment. And that their needs will always be met. I pray God that you would help them to always continue to have fun together. 
and to don't allow the stressors of life to disrupt them from enjoying each other. Father, I pray, God, that at some point, if it's their desire, God, to bring forth children into this marriage, I pray, God, that you would bless his seed in her womb. Amen. And all of the intricate parts, God, that go into the conception. And I'm praying, God, most important of all, that their home will always be a godly home. Yes. And that they will both be spiritually healthy. But not just spiritually healthy, God. I pray that they will both be physically healthy. May no sickness or disease befall either one of them. But I pray, God, if you delay your coming long enough, that they will have a long and prosperous and happy marriage. And I pray, God, that any children that come in of this marriage, I pray will be raised in a God-fearing home. That two will grow up, God, wanting to put you first as their Lord and Savior. And when it's all said and done, I pray, God, for the salvation of this family. That whether you have delayed your coming long enough and they've lived a long, fruitful life and are resting in the grave, or whether they're still in the land of the living, I pray, God, that when that trumpet sounds, That these two will be caught up in the sky to meet you in the air. But not only these two, but every one of their descendants. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. The church said amen, amen, amen. amen. and amen. The Old Testament scripture reading is coming to us from Psalms 98. I read verse 1, 4, and 5. Sing praise, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalms. Here's the word of the Lord. The New Testament scripture reading is taken from Colossians 3, 14 to 16. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Happy Sabbath, church. Will the deacons and deaconesses come forward to collect today's tithe and offering? As we come together to present our tithe and offering, let us reflect on the words of 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided to, in your heart to give. <laughs> 
not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. As we contribute today, let us do so with purpose, knowing that our collective generosity supports the work of the church and extends a helping hand to those in need. Your cheerful giving fuels our mission to spread love, compassion, and hope in our community and beyond. At Community Worship Center, there are four ways to give. There are a secure website, via Zelle, by mail, or by calling the church. Thank you for being a vital part of our Community Worship Center family. the tides into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Dear most kind and loving Father, we thank you for bringing us into your sanctuary on your Sabbath day. We thank you for allowing us to work and make the money that we need to return your tithe and offering. I pray that it may be used to further your work. In Jesus' name I do pray, amen. amen.
Bible says in Psalms 147, verse 1, praise the Lord, for it is good. It is what? Good. To sing praises to our God, Amen. for it is pleasant, and praise is becoming. For it is good to sing praises to our God. Brothers and sisters, it's, inter it's interesting how in church, one of the most divisive areas is music. Am I right or wrong? But brothers and sisters, it's so important to the worship experience. But not only is it important to the worship experience, but it's vitally important to our well-being. How many are aware of that? I know sometimes when I'm going through in the middle of the week, it's not a sermon that I put on, but it's a song. Because it speaks to our heart just as a sermon. And I want to share with you very quickly seven biblical purposes for music. First, there's the purpose of worship. Second Chronicles chapter 29 verse 28 says, And all the congregation worshipped. And the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. But secondly, there is the purpose of thanks. Psalms 147 verse 7 says, sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises upon the harp unto our God. Thirdly, there is the purpose of rejoicing. Psalms 98, verse 4, 4 and 5 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praises. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm. Then there is the purpose of consecration. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 139, verse 23, and this is spoken in a song. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Psalms 111, verse 1 says, praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright, that's in church, and in the congregation. Fifth, for the purpose of edification. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then six, there is the purpose of evangelism. Psalms chapter 40, verse 3 says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. And then lastly, there is the purpose of preservation of faith. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 145, verse 4 and 5, one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of all thy wondrous works. As we've come on this beautiful Sabbath, on this music day, this is not a spectator event. 
but it's a worship encounter. And I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to join in the atmosphere of worship as we sing unto the Lord for all the great things that he has done. Happy Sabbath, family. Happy Sabbath, family. You all look so beautiful. It's so good to see so many of your smiling faces. Welcome to our hymn fest, amen? Amen. amen. I'm gonna ask for the members of the praise team to come and join me and for the men's chorale to please come and assemble at this time. So if you are anything like me, there is a very special place in your heart for the hymns of the church. When I was younger, you know, my parents used to sing hymns and we would sing hymns in church all the time, but it wasn't until I got older that I developed a special appreciation for the hymns because sometimes the only song that's gonna get you through is a hymn. Um, today we're gonna sing together. We're gonna raise our voices as we sing the hymns of the church. Our motto at CWC is GROW, which stands for guidance, relationship, outreach, and worship. Today we're gonna sing different hymns that tie into each aspect of GROW. We also have a very special guest with us today, the wonderful soprano, Ms. Brandy Sutton, and she is going to bless us in song. Amen. Amen. So whether you're here with us in the sanctuary or if you're watching online, we encourage you to sing along. If you don't have your hymnal, that's okay. The words will be on the screens for your um, viewing pleasure. So let's praise the Lord together and have a good time in Jesus. never fail. The CWC Men's Chorale will lead us as we sing two hymns about guidance. He leadeth me and guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
For therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Join us as we sing songs about the relationship with our Savior, blessed assurance, and oh, how I love Jesus.
Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Jesus 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Our mission as Christians is, to not, is not only to love one another, but also to do just what the verse states. Join us as we sing, Bringing in the Sheaves and Seeking the Lost.
As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Brandy Sutton will, now, will bring us Come Thou Fount, followed by the praise team singing Higher Ground. <laughs> about you um, and I said no because today is not about me today I am a vessel for the Lord to just send a word hymns pastor myself as well if I'm upset I sing a song if I'm happy I sing a song if I am angry I sing a song it's how I make it through and the words of hymns have gotten me, I mean, when I was young and just, you know, singing them in church, it was like, eh, okay, it was routine, it was tradition, to the point where I almost grew numb to it, until I started singing about outside of church and realized that there is a world out there that is not living the life I'm used to. And these souls are hurting, and they need these words. And so I'm so glad and thankful to God that he gave me the gift that he gave me so that I can be amongst those people and share the joy that I know from growing up the way that I did in the church with hymns. So today, one of my most favorite hymns, I'm going actually two of my most favorite hymns, I am going to uh, sing for you. So I pray that you are blessed. Feet 
while a student at Oakwood University, yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I was blessed to get so much musical enrichment before I even started my training. I was a biology major. I didn't even know I wanted to be a singer. And just growing up around Oakwood, you get so, so much. I, to the point where now, whenever I go to sing, even in an opera, and people say, oh, you're from Oakwood. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes I am. And I'm just so proud. And so this is also a hymn that I got to sing um, with the Aeolians. I'm going to do it as a solo for you today. So you must understand how joyful I am and full of glee to have Russell, <laughs> a fellow Oakwoodite, <laughs> on the keys. Because <laughs> we didn't rehearse. But this is what Oakwood can give you. <laughs> Come 
Lavona and her team, our Minister of Music for putting this program on today. All of the talent that we have in this church, amen, who has lifted their voices to sing praises to God. And to uh, Miss Brandy, thank you for blessing us. Thank you. So beautiful. You know, the Bible says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. It was at midnight. Someone may have come here today and you're experiencing midnight. For some, midnight may represent the loss of a loved one, may represent the loss of employment, could represent struggle and challenges and issues in your marriage. Midnight for some could represent a child who is lost in this world. There may be someone tuning in right now from midnight because they're in their hospital bed. Or they just received a bad report. But brothers and sisters, it's so powerful to me that as Paul and Silas were there at midnight in a dark prison or dungeon, chained for a crime they did not commit, for no crime was committed at all, Yet they found courage and strength enough to pray and to sing. And the Bible doesn't say that they tried to do it silently or to, because of their experience, they were discouraged, so they just whispered a song or prayer. But it says, and the prisoners heard them. And so, I don't know who you are today, or who may even be tuning in, but my prayer is that there, if you came here at midnight, that there was some, some song, some words to a hymn that have strengthened you in your experience. But even more importantly than that, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you on this day that even when you leave this place, that you find yourself a song, that you find yourself a hymn, something that you can go to when you are all alone. When you're experiencing life and it seems like nothing is going right, but there is something about the power of a song. The Bible doesn't say you have to make a, a good sounding noise. Doesn't say you have to be a trained or professional singer or even one who knows how to hold the note. It just simply says that you ought to make a joyful noise. And what I want to encourage us today is that while we always talk about 
finding the right words or the right message or the right sermon that the pastor preached, if I could just recall to my memory, that will help me through this time. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, all we need is the words to a song. Where you can do like David when his family was kidnapped. He didn't know where they are. But he went and encouraged himself in the Lord. And the way he did it was he went and got his instrument. And he began to sing. And so, brothers and sisters, on this day, find yourself a song. I'm looking forward to the, the day when all of this is over. And the Bible says we'll sing a new song. So find yourself a song. That you can see it, sing it while you're kneeling at your bedside. You can sing it in the shower. You can sing it while driving to work, or walking to work. Or you can even sing it at your desk. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, it's those songs. Many of you felt it today because you've experienced the power of these songs these hymns in your life. And so as I pray for us now, before I turn it over to our minister of music, if you're here today and you want to just say, God, help me to find a song when I'm going through something that will strengthen and encourage me, whoever you are, just raise your hand now. Father, we thank you. For you've given us voices. And you've given us music. You've given us songs. So that even when we're experiencing life and all of his un certainty even when we are experiencing our midnight moments and seasons we can be like Paul and Silas where we can pray and sing praises unto you Father help us to never lose that heart or desire because there's something about when we begin to sing praises unto you, God, that it begins to lift us, uh, our emotions, our, our feelings. Uh, it may not in that moment change our circumstance, but it helps us to feel better about ourselves. But most importantly, God, it helps us to feel better about you. As we remind ourselves that while we're going through, yet what we're going through is not the end. Because our God has the final word. My prayer today, God, is we all would leave this place when it's all said and done. With a new song that will strengthen us as we tarry on until you come. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Were you blessed today? Were you blessed by the hymns that were sung today? Yes, it was a beautiful day. It was a beautiful hymn fest. 
we will do this again. We thank you all for your participation. We thank you all for coming out, for your support. It's just, so my heart is full. My heart is very, very full. Um, like I said earlier, hymns have a, a very special place in my heart. But just looking out and seeing you all enjoy yourself, seeing you all sing. You know, when we do praise and worship, and I know sometimes we sing some stuff that not everybody loves, and that's okay, but there's something about the hymns that just, it seems like it just brings everybody together. And so seeing everyone today um, sing and praise and worship just really warmed my heart, and it really, really... Um, it just made me smile. So bless all of you. Um, I just want to say some quick thank yous to um, some folks. I want to thank Pastor Ridley and the church board for giving uh, the music department uh, this opportunity to um, have our music appreciation day today. I want to thank the music ministry team. Um, if you're on the music ministry team, if you can just stand or wave your hand so the church knows who you are. Um, give a round of applause for our music ministry team, please. Um, they have been very supportive and, and very patient with me um, and been uh, team players as we have navigated through um, just making not just today, but also the year um, special and, and successful. So I want to thank them. I want to thank the men's chorale, the, uh, the, the CWC church choir. I guess that's who you all are right now because you are the only choir. But we want to thank Elder Edwards, amen, Elder Edwards and the men's chorale for their ministry in music. I want to especially thank the praise teams. So I, I, I want to thank you guys. I do. I love y'all. And it's difficult sometimes um, being in positions of leadership, especially because they are, they are all leaders in this church. And they come out, rehearse, sing, body's tired, voice is tired, spirit's tired, and sing weekly, sometimes multiple times a month. And there's a lot that goes into it. And being a singer, or singing, because I'm not a singer, but I sing. Um, singing, it's, 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 it's an emotional thing. Um, and if you know me, you know that my heart bleeds church, my heart bleeds music. And so having folks behind me that are willing to sing and willing to minister, and sometimes even when we don't want to, we still get up and do it because we know that there is a blessing to be given and there's a blessing to be received. So I just wanna thank the praise team, my family, I wanna thank you all. I, I have to, and I will always thank the band. Please give a round of applause for the band. Wesley, Tyler, Markley, and our MD, Brother Russell. They show up every Sabbath. Rain, sleet, snow, tsunami, hurricane, sandstorm, I don't know, but they are here every Sabbath, every single Sabbath. They sit on these benches with no back. I know y'all backs hurt. I'm going to buy y'all heating pads or something. I, I know it's uncomfortable, but they are here every Sabbath and just add that special, that special something to our worship. Without you guys, the worship would not be what it is. And I want to thank you all in the beginning, I said the congregation, just when we're up here and we're singing and your smiles and your encouragement and the way you sing and the 
all the, 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 the extra band members, the tambourine and the maracas and the, maybe next week we'll have a xylophone, I don't know. But there's all, we got all kinds of just extra stuff going on. Sometimes I look up and I'm like, where is that coming from? But there's, there's always some uh, extra sound and, and make a joyful noise, right? So we just thank you. I thank you all. We love you. I love all of y'all. Thank you. God bless. God bless. So please join us. Please stand and join us as we sing our closing hymn. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Before that, I just want to remind everyone, I'm sorry I should have done this before, we have a concert this afternoon at 4 p.m., our choir fest. We will have choirs here from Ebenezer, from Kingsboro, from Mount Sinai, and a few others. So please uh, come back. If you're leaving, come back and join us. If you're staying, um, we do have lunch prepared. And let's just Let's just have a great day. We're going to sing all day. We're going to praise the Lord all day. We're going to hang out together all day, and we're just going to have a happy Sabbath. It is well.
just before we close to pray, please blame it on my head. I forgot to thank my sister, Brandy Sutton. She has been singing with this beautiful voice for years, and we just pray that God continues to keep you and continues to keep that voice. The first time I heard Brandy sing over 20 years ago, when we were students at Oakwood, she blew me away and has continued to do so. And we just pray that you continue to use your gift for the Lord. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultlessly before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen.